Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Lucy. Um, I've never actually shared in front of so many people, so I'm actually quite worried at the moment. <laughs> Sitting over there, it seemed like many people, but up here, it's not more. Um, well, I was born, as you know, I go to Alateen. Um, I was born in 94, and, you know, from, I've had a, I had a good childhood. Um, my nan died in 1999, and that was a sort of turning point for the whole family sort of started, you could see differences. And um, my mum, who is an alcoholic, recovering alcoholic in my life, um, that was when you could, that's when she started drinking socially, going out and do's and events and stuff. Um, and we went to Thailand for a month, and I loved it at the time, and I didn't see anything wrong with it. But looking back on it now, I could see how it was very strange, and because we were there for so long, it was sort of the family together trying to, like, no arguments, and, you know, it was, it was a difficult time. And um, we had, <laughs> talking about it with my mum earlier, trying to work out what I was going to say, and um, I thought we had, like, a room with a balcony, so when my mum put me to bed, she could sort of go out and have some time for herself, but I got told today that she didn't, and we were just stuck in one bedroom. So now looking back, like I said, it, it was a very strange holiday, even though I loved <clears throat> I loved it at the time. Um, my dad was a cricketer for 19 years, so he was away for most of my childhood. And um, I got bullied at school for six years because I was the tallest one in my class, and I was one that played football with all the lads and, you know, got, got dirty in the mud, you know how it is. Um, and I moved to school in year five because it got to the point where I wasn't going, I refused to go. I'd go to school and then just sit outside my classroom. Um, and yeah, I had big anger issues. Um, my dad's benefit year came and he's a big drinker himself. And, um, you know, going out to events with lots of people, everyone, lots of alcohol, it was sort of normal to see people drunk. Um, so when my mum started drinking a lot heavier, it was just normal for me because I'd seen it for most of my life. Um, he left cricket and started to come um, work at a football club. And the first two years were fine because he was coming home early. You know, so I got to see my dad a lot more, which was quite nice for me, but hard at the same time because I didn't actually know how to have a proper relationship with him. Um, but after that two years, my mum started drinking at home a lot more. And obviously I, I moved to school and there was a couple of occasions where she didn't come and pick me up. So my school was only five minutes down the road, so I'd walk home and then find her asleep on the sofa and think, oh my God, what, what's going on? Just leave her there, you know. And then the argument started because Dad started to come home later, leaving for work a bit earlier. So really, I then didn't want to go to school even more because of the fact that I was worried that if my mum stayed drunk that extra bit, what, what could happen to her? Um, <clears throat> and then I... I don't know how to explain it. I'd always sort of lived under his shadow because he did well when he was playing cricket. And I remember being at primary school and I had this sticker chart and um, I completed it all and we had to go up in assembly to get a award for it. And I got up in assembly, a congratulations reward. And then he went, my head teacher turned around to me and said, oh, didn't your dad do really well at cricket? How many runs did he get? And I died inside. It was awful. I just stood there. And he was like, no way, you didn't just say that to me. Um, and I always felt like I didn't live up to his expectations and that I wasn't going to be all that he'd wanted me to be. Um, and I got in with the wrong crowd when mum's thinking really got serious. And there was, you know, I was 12 at the time and I was the little one tagging along behind all the boys thinking I was really hard. And But really now I wasn't at all. And they were all taking drugs, they were drinking. You know, that's that's all I really knew was, well, not all I knew, but, you know, both my parents drank. So I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, it's cool. Let's just try it. I didn't take any drugs, which is a good thing. But it got 
worse and worse and I was staying out later. I was coming in, I wasn't spending much time at home. And um and then well, I say that we became Samhamptons and the shower because there'd be fourteen, fifteen of my friends staying at one time over the whole weekend and it went from Friday night to Saturday night and then Saturday night became Sunday. So I was constantly surrounded by alcohol at that point. Um and then um family time just went there wasn't any. We'd never have dinner together. Um, everything just was a mess really because I'd drop in my bedroom and my mum would be in my lounge and then my dad would be downstairs drinking. And I'd always wait because I, I knew he used to come home at half nine on the dot. So at quarter past nine before I went to bed I used to run around the house and try and find as many bottles as I possibly could to put in the next door neighbour's bin. So then I didn't get the wrap of it when he got home because obviously my mum was asleep on the sofa so she was sort of out of it. And I'd get how many shad. He'd come and wake me up find out how much he drank that night. Um, <coughs> there was arguments all the time. And, well, I don't think I sort of... Well, I think we became to the point where it wasn't actually talking. We just shout at each other for, for the sake of it. And that's, that's just how it was. Um, and then, because my mum was getting quite a lot of attention because of her drinking... I thought, and then I'm just going to kick off even more so I do get some attention. And someone does pay attention to me because I was at the point where they wouldn't care if I'd go out. I'd go out later and then just turn up and Dad would be downstairs and I wouldn't even get, oh, you're right, this. Um, making his dinner sometimes. You know, it's, it's a difficult thing, but at the end of the day, I had to do it. And I was brought up with adults in an adult environment. I can't even think of the word now. But, um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I was brought up with, so I was lucky enough to have the advantage that I could deal with things that most other seven, eight-year-olds wouldn't be able to deal with. Um, my mum got sober two years ago, and then someone said to me the other day, oh, you know, when, when they first stop drinking, they can be quite, you know, scared and afraid of things, but to be honest, she really wasn't. And um, after the first year of being sober, my mum took me out of my home environment, and we moved out, and... Wow. And it was the best thing that she could have possibly done for me because I started going back to school. I got my education sorted out. I got in with another group of friends. And, you know, all because of her moving me out of the situation, we weren't arguing, we were being able to talk to each other, having dinner together, you know, just little things like that mean quite a lot to me. Um, my dad met a partner four months after we moved out and he told me at a petrol station and I was livid. And I... At the time, I had quite bad anger issues, and anything would just make me fly off the hook. And I did. And I can just remember sitting in the car, shouting, screaming at him. And he was going, do you want to stop? And I was like, no, but he stopped anyway. He didn't care. I was just like, I just want to get back so I can just go out and just get some fresh air. Um, and I didn't have a relationship with him for about four months, because he just took it one step too far, and I couldn't cope it. Um, he wanted to see me all the time and was ringing me and then I'd do something and then they'd ignore me. And it got to the point where I felt like they were using me like all of my other friends over my life had done. Um, and it made me even worse because, you know, I just didn't know what to expect. And I had quite high expectations of him, thinking, oh, when we move out, he'll still want to see me, you know, and then he didn't because he had his new family. And he was more worried about having clothes on their back and shoes on their feet than whether I did. Um, I used to get a school bus to school because I went to school in Winchester and he didn't pay it. So my mum had to drop me in for a week. He didn't ask her if she wanted any petrol money, didn't offer to take me in and then kicked up a fuss when he had to go and pay it. And took in a wad of cash and counted it four times in front of my head of year and one of my PE teachers just to make sure it was right. And it, sh you know, it showed me up. And I was so embarrassed, but luckily all of my teachers know what was going on, so they understood that it wasn't actually me just being a pain. Um, but I've, I started Alateen last September, or August, I think, and for just a small amount of time which I've been in, it's been that. I don't know how to explain it, really. It's been amazing. Um, I can look at, like, I had a nice house with everything I could have asked for, but both my parents were drinking. And now, you know, I've got my little flat, which is all cushy, and my mum's not drinking. My dad still is, but 
you know, I have to accept that because he doesn't realise he's got a problem with alcohol. And, you know, I smile a lot more. Me and my mum can have laughs over like proper things other than just trying to smile and keep everything happy. Um, and when my dad's girlfriend's father started shouting at me and I just got up and walked off. And I went upstairs and I just chuckled to myself and then started crying because it really upset me. But I thought to myself, you know what, I haven't, I didn't think it was working for me. And then just seeing myself walk away from the situation, which I usually would have just laid into and started screaming, oh. shouting. And I was really proud of myself. And I never used to speak to my dad about how I felt. And um, I got told by someone in Al-Anon, who's an Alateen sponsor, just to turn around and say, well, I'm sorry you see it like that. And I did, and I said it to him a little while ago, and he just stood there, his mouth hit the floor, and he stared at me for about 15 minutes. And I hated the awkward silence, but it was what needed to happen. And, you know, I can I can take a step back, and it feels like I'm having an adequate experience, because I can stand there, I can still see myself in a situation, but I can take myself out of it, and think of the best situations to get around the problem. Which, and I'm so, I'm just so grateful for AA, Alan or not Alateen, because if it wasn't around, well, I don't know what I would be doing. But, yeah. So I'm very grateful for you all inviting me to come and share, and thank you for listening. Thank you. It was absolutely marvellous for someone who claimed to be nervous that didn't come across at all whatsoever. Lucy, thank you so much. I really enjoyed what you had to say. Um, you're very, very brave. And now, for our second act. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to introduce Steve, who's travelled all the way over from Bristol. So Steve is from Alanon, and he's going to uh, share for us. Indeed, I am Stephen from Al-Anon, and I have come from Bristol, and I thought I was coming to what I normally be primarily, when you see these things, AA meetings with a dotted number of um, Al-Anon people and might be one or two al but now I find I'm talking to an Al-Anon meeting, I think, and this is going to cause me some difficulties, because normally when I have a chance to share at a large meeting, I have this idea that I'm talking to people who are mainly alcoholics. And so the first thing I do is I ingratiate myself to them. I say, I love you. (laughs) That's my problem. (laughs) Because it's true. I I love my wife and I love my daughter. And uh, (sighs) what do I say to my fellow Alan Honours? I I say to you in a way, for me, uh, speaking as an atheist, you are to a great degree, my higher power. And it's good to be with you. It's really good to be with you. Now, I did come down from Bristol. It really isn't that far, let's be honest. Um, the next speaker, I think, comes from slightly further. Or at least he hails from slightly further away. I won't spoil what he's got to say by telling you, revealing it. But when I got here, I gave myself plenty of time. I got here at 20 past five. I arrived in the car park. I wonder how many alcoholics would do that. And... Uh, and right, and I'm 66, I'll be 67 next month, and anybody else, any man particularly who's near my age will know there are times when you simply got to go. And I rushed up to the reception here at the church, and I said, I'm speaking at the meeting here today, and she looked at me blankly, completely blank, and I said, um, and I need to go to the loo. And I could tell from her face this was not something that she was going to help me with. And I said, please, you know, I'm old. I'm desperate. She said, nothing. Nothing. Well, she said, well, you can't go here. I'm working late and you can't come in. So I sort of quietly, perhaps, perhaps not too quietly, said, well, that's pretty unchristian, isn't it? And rushed off to the local dent- uh, doctor's surgery. And at that point, I realized that one of my slogans in life had let me down because I wasn't able to let go and let God. Um, I I honestly thought until I was in my early 60s that my life was pretty easy. I had a kind of gilded 
life. Nothing had seriously gone wrong. I hadn't suffered any major bereavements, and certainly never occurred to me that alcoholism would have anything at all to do with my life. Not for one moment. And then my first marriage had broken up after 35 years, and a few years later, I married again, about six years ago. And little did I know that I'd married an alcoholic, but I found out. And I found out really quite quickly. And it's amazing what you can find out on the internet. When you start to see certain behaviours, when you see someone where you can't actually have a bottle in the house that is left undrunk. I mean, I'd always been used to the idea that one could have bottles stored away, a wine, that is. And uh, you keep them, and when you want to drink them, you drink from a bottle. It didn't work. It just didn't work. I couldn't get over the idea initially that she never seemed to suffer from hangovers. And, of course, I soon engaged in all the tricks. I mean, it's, it's hard not to repeat exactly what almost everybody here has been through. In fact, uh, Lucy's already touched on uh, one of those things. And her wonderful share, by the way. I mean, normally if I'm sharing and the person's ahead of me, I hardly listen to a word they've got to say because I'm so nervous. But actually, Lucy, I was compelled to listen to everything you say, which means I'm even less well prepared to talk to you today than usual. And even now, I think I forgot what I was going to say next. And I suppose it doesn't really matter too much. But um, I, there I was. I was with uh, my new wife, and she drank. And I would engage in things like, oh, well, um, if I drink half a bottle, then she drinks less. It didn't work. Uh, I used to go to the supermarket with her until I got banned from Tesco's or indeed from Sainsbury's and everywhere else because I wasn't any good at shopping. I wasn't fit to go to Tesco's. Now, the reason I went, of course, was because I could control or try to control the amount of wine that she bought at the supermarket. And the games go on. Uh, and I discovered, it's interesting, after she um, came into AA and I heard some of her shares, through her shares, I learned, of course, that she'd been using mugs or what supposedly was water because she told me she loved drinking water. And, of course, <laughs> it was white wine. And uh, she would have hidden away in various cupboards stocks of wine I knew nothing about. I had not really thrown away bottles of wine. I somehow couldn't bring myself to throw away all that money. But in the end, I was driven to do it occasionally. And of course, it's a complete and utter waste of time. Well, one evening, after being subjected to the usual one-hour diatribe, which included calling me an idiot and I'm stupid and that I uh, don't want to be there, I want to be where I come from, which is in the northwest of England, and that my children hate me, and everybody laughs at me and thinks I'm ridiculous. All this would go on for about an hour. In the end, I sort of blurted out, you're an alcoholic. And I thought that might have some effect. In fact, she just got angrier. She got very, very seriously angry. And I found it really quite frightening, to be honest. I mean, I can joke a bit, but living with an alcoholic can at times be very, very frightening. There's an awful lot of talk in the outside world. I know in this country you will all understand that's one of the wonderful things about the fellowship is just knowing. You know. I, I don't have to elaborate. You just know what I've been through. I know what you've been through. Um, the fact is that it, it, when you suffer to kind of verbal abuse, it's, it's, it's diminishing. You spend your whole time, I spent my whole time thinking, is it true? Am I this inadequate? Am I this hopeless? I always had got, I had thought, reasonably high self-esteem. And it began to be gnawed at and gnawed at and gnawed at. And I found that terribly difficult. And I cast around and I discovered again on the internet Al-Anon. And I went to the local, um, one of the rehabilitation places in Bristol. And I said, can you help me? He said, yes, there's an Al-Anon group that meets on Thursdays. I said, right, I'll come. And she said, yes, but I do think you should tell your wife. Don't come in secret. So I did. And she said, no, you can't. And I was too scared. I was too scared to go. It happened, however, a matter of a few months later, that I had some, a cousin of mine over from the States, and her husband, and they come to stay for a week. And I said, look, um, Jerry's a recovering alcoholic. Uh, you might like to 
go easy on the alcohol while he's here. Shows you what I knew at that time about um, AA. And uh, she inwardly cursed. And it came that the night that Jerry wanted to go to an AA meeting in Bristol, uh, I was out. I had a course that I was on. I couldn't go. And I said to her, do you think you could take Jerry to this meeting? When I came back uh, from that night, I walked into the kitchen. There was Jerry. He sort of looked a bit pleased with himself. And uh, my wife was in another room. And he said, uh, she's one of us. I said, what? And what had happened was, in effect, he had 12 stepped her. Um, She'd gone there, she sat as the chauffeur in the meeting, and she suddenly realised she was in the right place. And she hasn't had a drink since then. And I owe a great deal to my American family for all of that. Now the interesting thing is, it didn't stop there, the connections. About a year later, my elder daughter, opposite from my first marriage, and she's now, was it, 41, um, gave my wife a call, obviously her stepmother, and she says, I think I may be an alcoholic. Can you help me? She lives in Derbyshire. I live in Bristol. My wife got in the car, she drove off to Derbyshire and took her round several meetings, 12 and successfully 12 steps her. Now, I had thought that I lived in this world where there was no alcoholism around me at all. I really did think that I was normal in every way in that respect. My family was normal. My father didn't drink. My mother didn't drink, apart from a sherry in the evening when she was older. And uh, suddenly I discovered that my own daughter was an alcoholic. And my second wife had 12 stepped her. And it's hard to say if there are any people here from AA, and I think they are, the depth of the gratitude that I feel towards AA for what AA has done and is doing for both my wife and my daughter. Because in letting go and letting God, I can, in a sense, say every time I find life difficult for them, and I do very often, I can say, no, they're being cared for and they're caring for themselves. How about me caring about me? And I thought I always had, but I discovered that I hadn't. And I also discovered that I am a rescuer and I am someone and we are specialists in this it's in Al-Anon, I'm someone who wants to control what's going on. And through the program I started to look back over my life. I looked at some of my behaviours. Why is it that my children almost dread going to a restaurant with me? Why? Because I single-mindedly believed and I hate to say it at times, the rush of blood still makes me do it, that I could improve the British catering industry. It wasn't just about complaining. I was on a kind of mission. I believed that, you know, we should have people serving in this country like they have in America, where service is important. And I would explain this to all the staff. Now, I know... I know complaining can be quite important. I know it's an un-British activity, but nevertheless, it can help people. But again, it's about... And I would do it to excess. You know, if an alcoholic would drink, get drunk on their alcohol, I could get drunk on ideas like this. Somehow, I was like a kind of restaurant messiah moving in to help them serve everybody. And I would make it clear to them exactly how it was they were falling short. Now, I never worked in the catering industry, by the way. I never worked remotely in that field. I don't have any particular expertise. Um, but I did it. And, interestingly, I'm just as likely to hand out little badges, gold stars, and I'll say to people, you've been an excellent waiter tonight. You're very good. And this is why you're good. And I would think this was good of me to do this somehow. Well, in a way, again, there's a little bit of it is good. But it's like everything. When it gets out of control, and when you start to think somehow you're something, when I start to think I'm something special, what is going on with me? What is that about? And I can tell you any number of instances. Uh, I don't know if you've heard my shares before. I don't think many of you have, so I can indulge in repeating some of these embarrassing episodes of my life. 
I, I remember in my early 20s going to Dixon's I'd had a camera that had broken and uh, Dixon's lost my camera and I pestered them and I went in there over and over again now by now one or two of you may notice that though I don't have to use it very much here I have a very loud voice I'm blessed with very big lungs and if I wanted to address you without this microphone I would find that exceedingly easy so when I see an audience I have this itch I have to address it now the Dixon's was full that day and um, I addressed the assembled customers as well, of course, as the manager or whoever it was. And I said, you're a disgrace. You can't run this place properly. You have lost my camera. And I think, this is a long time ago, I think I heard myself saying, you have ruined my life. <laughs> um, Sadly, round about the time of 9-11, I was going with my first wife on a cruise um, up to Alaska from Vancouver. And uh, there were difficulties with the incoming boat because a lot of the people were allowed not to leave it because they couldn't fly on anywhere because there was no flying because of 9-11. Which left a number of us who were about to go on it in quite a difficult position. Well, to cut a long story short, I was one of those who organized a mutiny on that ship. Now, if any of you have ever been on a cruise, you may know that these enormous ships have a huge atrium. And you can, actually, I found you could go up a deck or two and speak down <laughs> to the assembled group, uh, which I did. And I really made trouble. And there came a point at which, well, what you could approximate as a captain, cruise ships don't have captains. But uh, we'd set sail by then. And the trouble kept going. And I was kind of the spokesperson. There were some Americans also engaged in this, but they let me front it. And the captain said to me and my wife, he said, look, if you'll shut up, we'll upgrade you. <laughs> if you don't, I'm having you off this ship. And I don't think there are many people who have been on a cruise that have been threatened with being deported from a ship once it's set sail. And that happened to me. I mean, that's how extreme I can be. I do the same in airports. I remember once in Malaga Airport, I'd been looking for the car rental place. Uh, I, I'd walked out of what was the security zone, and I had to go back in. And I was infuriated. I thought, well, how could Malaga Airport be so unpleasant to me as to do this? And so when he said he'd do the search, I threatened to undress in front of him. I, I, any number of these excessive stories. And I, uh, sadly... I still do these kinds of things. But, you know, I was talking to someone just before we came in the meeting. What Al-Anon is doing for me at this early stage of recovery, and four years, in a sense, is less than three years, and three years and so on is less than two, because the longer you're in Al-Anon, the bigger the assignment, the bigger the job you realize you're on, and the earlier the stage in the journey you are, um, you know, just the way it is, you realize changing yourself through a spiritual program is an enormous, to me, an enormous task, trying to get to grips with these behaviours. What I'm beginning to do, a, a sign of some progress, is when I do it now, I clock it afterwards, very soon afterwards. You know, I realise, for example, when I talked to the receptionist and thought very bad things about Christianity in Ringwood, um, I thought, I'm doing it again. I am trying to arrange Christianity in Ringwood to my benefit. Um, but I can now think it through. I can now say, that is what I was doing. That is not good for me. It's not doing me any good. And I think for all of us in al -Anon, there are different things that are particularly hard. And I think for me, what is particularly hard is serenity. Um, I was brought up um, in the northwest of England, as I mentioned, in a place called the Wirral. It's a peninsula. And uh, those of you from Southampton will probably heard of Liverpool. And, you know, it, it's, I came, I, my father was a pilot there, a river pilot there. So some of you may know about river pilots. I can sort of find some attachment to this strange place, Southampton, um, through that. And I do think it's beautiful around here, by the way. There you are, I will ingratiate myself. But again, it's honest and it's true. And I, you know, I was lucky. My father had a good job, and he provided great stability. And I 
was sent away to public school, and if you've ever been to public school, it's a bit like being sent to jail. And I don't think I was equipped for it. I, I have this ability, I can talk like this, and I may look, may fool some of you into thinking I'm fairly accomplished. But the reality is all of us, certainly including me, have these kind of shells, these things that you put around you. And for me, one of the other things I've learned in Al-Anon, that the fact that I can speak is nothing more than a protection so that I don't have to hear what you've got to say. If I can talk and I can be articulate, then I'm in control, not you. And as someone said, um, are you listening to me? Or are you waiting to say what you want to say? And you know, there's so much of that. And listening, the listening process in the fellowship, and learning to listen is one of the important things. Now, I think as a child, though, I, I, I am very thin-skinned then, and I am now, and I found the whole business of being what I regarded as in a kind of jail, both helped me to become a survivor, but also to protect myself from my real feelings. And suddenly, of course, in al I'm starting to find out what some of those things are, and just how vulnerable, in a way, I am, and how much it hurts when I do get the abuse, um, how much it hurts when I say with my daughter can't talk to me because she's isolating because she's recovering from alcoholism and the problems that are hidden away there are, you know, come to the surface and it feels like, well, why won't she talk to me? And I said, well, I know why she won't because she's got her own difficulties and I just have to respect that and respect that what she's doing in her program will help her and it helps me to understand that but it's still frightening when your own daughter finds a lot of other difficulties that have now really come to the surface big time, given that she doesn't have the protection of alcohol. And I'm finding, for me, that no longer being able to think, oh, well, I am self-assured, I am self-confident, I am strong, I can now start to see through the, the spiritual program, actually, I do have some great weaknesses. And I've been working for about two years, I think it is, on my fourth step, and Blueprint for Progress, to me, is the most fantastic publication. And I'm so much in love with it, I won't stop working on it. I, I really, my sponsor's very patient with me, because I know, I hear people who say, oh, I've done my fourth step in two weeks or something, and I think, but this is such a comprehensive self-examination, and it is asking me so much about myself, and I'm learning so much. And through Al Anon, having a non-judgmental sponsor listening to me hour after hour after hour. I can talk. Golly. I can talk. And he listens. And uh, it's a revelation. When, when you see there are certain things, you know, for example, I've always regarded myself as an honest person. I, I am in terms of I would never steal things and I'm filled with rectitude about not um, doing things that I shouldn't do. In fact, I was called and considered at school. It's funny how those school years define your life so much. I was a goody-goody. I was a goody-goody. I am a goody-goody. You know, I worry about the rules everywhere around us. I don't want to break the rules, and yet I want to be with people like alcoholics who do want to break the rules. It's exciting. And uh, I've, I've really had to come to terms with a little bit of what this is about. And one of the things I learned about in looking about honesty is really whether I'm honest with myself. I may be true that I don't steal. I don't cheat. I play by the rules. But if I'm emotionally dishonest, and I don't mean by that by deceit, saying I've... Uh, not done something when I have. I mean something more profound, I think. Um, above all, that I think I've been kind to myself. I think I have looked after my own needs when I now realize there are certain needs that I haven't been looking after. They just haven't. And I'm beginning to understand some of that. An uh, example was, it happened to me, I went, I, I love going to um, conventions. 
and I went to the Lanzarote convention this February and when we arrived there my wife looked at this place and said I don't like this place I want to go home now and I didn't dare say anything because it might make it worse so I said nothing and after a few days she said I am going home and she did have some business reason to do it and I suppose I could come to terms with it in that way but then she said and uh, you'll be coming with me now, I honestly believe I've never done anything like this in my life before. And I've been around a lot of Al-Anon people at that convention. And I said, no, no, I'm not coming back with you. I want to stay here. I want to stay through, not only through the end of the convention, but the extra days that we booked. I want to enjoy the fellowship of the people around me. I love these conventions. I love being with people. And I love both the being around people in recovery and in Al-Anon. And I didn't want to leave. And yet it was a gut-wrenching decision for me to make because I'm just not used to that standing up to things in that kind of way. Or I've been so codependent, and I am an archetypal codependent. But I actually said, no, you can go, uh, but I'm not. She went, and I stayed. Now, I won't deny I was really in a, in a state of some inner turmoil. But I'm so glad I did it. I had a great time with a few other old codgers there like me. And we hung out together and did our thing. And it was wonderful. And uh, it was an important step forward for me. And I can remember even a few months before that, I had uh, had a pretty bad day with my wife. And um, I'd, I'd called a friend of mine in al -Anon. We'd met up and had coffee. And he said to me, don't go back yet. Don't go back. Why not do some things that you'd like? So I phoned up the local um, relaxation centre, booked a massage. I went for a walk on my own. I had a lovely massage. I was happy to be with a masseur who also knows about the 12-step programme. And in the evening I went straight on to an Al-Anon meeting. And finally, about nine o'clock, I rolled up home to a rather subdued wife. And uh, I again... I've never done these kind of things. I'd be too scared, or too worried, or wasn't doing the right thing. I did it. I think I did the right thing. And uh, you know, these are big, big steps for me in trying to put some my certain things first about myself. I'm not trying to say that I'm a better person than my wife. Not at all. Not at all. And the things that I see, I understand now so well that alcoholism, alcoholism is an illness. And I respect that, but it's still very hard when you're being under you're under a kind of assault to hang in there and remember that. But I do try, and it's it's um, it has completely changed to some extent how I live my life. There is so much more I need to do because I still get upset. I still find myself examining what's wrong with me, and I'm still very very prickly, and I tend to rise to criticism all the time. And I can always remember one of the readings in Courage to Change, I think it is, and it talks about people giving offence and then those who choose to take offence. And you don't have to choose to take offence. And I usually do choose to take offence. But it's there for me to keep drip, drip, drip understanding what's going on. So, that's me. I'm a lad from the Wirral who doesn't have a Scouse accent had a very privileged upbringing and now find myself with a daughter who's an alcoholic and a wife who's an alcoholic. My mother died three years ago and the last conversation I had with her two and a half days before she died she said to me she said, I think and she was talking about her father who I'd never met because he died in a practical joke outside a pub in 1939 and by the way I was born after that. And she said, I think he was an alcoholic. Now, she'd never said, or hinted even, at that before. But as I, since she's died, have done a lot of work on my grandfather's life, he was very, very successful. And, and again, a tragic figure, because it all collapsed spectacularly. A rather brilliant man. It all starts to make sense. Everything had happened to him. And I also see that my mother, therefore, was the adult child of an alcoholic. This is the lad who thought he was normal and who thought alcohol 
nothing to do with this one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce our final chair, who's from Alcoholics Anonymous. Part of this come from Midhurst, Sussex. I remember <clears throat> my early, early days that uh, if I couldn't do something better than anybody else, I wouldn't do it at all. I would just bow out because I had to be the best. I just heard two brilliant chairs. Now what the hell am I going to do? <laughs> I'm going to walk away here or am I going to try to stand up to this one? <laughs> my name is Bud <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I use my last name because I tell people in these meetings in my group more information than I've ever told anybody that I knew as friends. And they all knew my last name. And here I come in here and we say, oh, my name's Bud. But who? Uh, uh, and at my age, and 66 is nothing, trust me, <laughs> that... Uh, if I go into hospital and somebody comes in to see me and they're going to say, and who are you going to see? And he says, we want to see Bud. But who? Well, you know, he's that American guy that's in here. Short little American guy. What do you mean? you? Uh, well, he's the guy that does this, that, that, and that. They know more about me. The only thing they don't know is my last name. Oh, what's that? Yes, to the press, the media, I understand that. Our anonymity is very, very precious. But in these groups, and when I'm talking to my friends and people here that I love and I know, then that's got nothing to do with it, nothing to do with me anymore. So anyway, I will tell you a little bit about me and, and my past history. My, uh, my sobriety date is the 8th of February, 1983. And since that date, I haven't had a mind or mood-altering chemical. Probably have had some chemicals. But they were prescribed to me, and I only had them as that period of time in my health that I needed to take them, and I was off them very, very quickly. I remember when I was in the, uh, getting my bypass surgery, didn't know I had a problem. And um, <clears throat> after the surgery was over, the, um, they kept coming in with all these, these painkillers. I said, I'm not in pain. I'm not in pain. I don't, I don't want any of that stuff. Everybody else was in there said, well, could I have two of those? Or I might just have or four. Because my attitude is if two is good, three are better, and four is never going to be enough. Because you see, in Bud's dictionary, he didn't have words in there like enough, 50%, moderation. Those didn't exist. It was... Pull after burner or stop cop. And I'll tell you about that Air Force part of my life here in a bit. So that I had to think about. But as I look back today, and I look back on the whole of, of my uh, my growing up within this fellowship, I, it brings to, to, really brings out that I never matured emotionally because I found a way of bypassing those pain barriers of growing up emotionally. Physically, I grew up, but when I started drinking, I stopped growing up emotionally because then I found that I could take a substance there that calmed things down a little bit for me. I didn't have to get into those terrible emotional problems like love and responsibility and those kind of crazy things. Um, and so when... Bud got sober. All of a sudden, he's physically big, well, but emotionally, he has never gotten past independence. He went through dependent as a child, independent as a teenager, and he started drinking, and he never got to interdependent. He never got there. So anyway... Let me go back a little bit now and talk a little bit for those of you who might 
wonder whether or not I qualify to be in these rooms that I have been. At the age of, uh, oh, I don't know, I don't know, about probably 22, I, I, was, uh, I was in the uh, U.S. Air Force. Now, I didn't do any drinking before then uh, that I could think of because, number one, I didn't have the money. We were really rather poor. And, uh, and when I was in university, it was only at parties, occasionally in the fraternity or whatever it was. And I'd be the guy that tried to be the, the best, right? So I'd be the one climbing up the walls in the girls' dormitory to try to get in there and run up and down the halls, making complete ass of myself. But those were things that I did that set me apart, that made me a little bit different than you, because I couldn't be just like you. It wasn't, that wasn't me. Anyway, I remember uh, uh, I had to join uh, join the Air Force in university because um, it was called the ROTC, the Reserve Officer Training, and it was during the Korean War. But if you wanted to go to university, you had you could stay for four years, but you had to join one of these. And some of the Army had some of the colleges, and the Navy had some. And the one I went to just happened to be the Air Force. And they said then you could get your four years, and we'll pay you the last couple of years, give you some money. Uh, as part of it, but uh, you had to give us then four years, but you came in as an officer, you came in as a second lieutenant, or you stayed two years in university and then you went as a private in the army, well the, the odds are different on that one, I thought well I can give four years for this, so when I came out of university I was bang, so I didn't have gap years or any of that sort of stuff, boom, I was in the air force, and uh, they said well, Looks like you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You probably want to get to be a pilot. So I went to pilot training. Um, and that's what I did for 20 years. I flew jet fighters. And it was, it was a marvelous, marvelous, uh, um, I couldn't, I couldn't ask for anything better than that. I'm playing with the world's most expensive toys. And they're paying me to do it. Now, of course, they did say later on when I had to go to Vietnam and, and fly uh, 100 missions in combat uh, that it's your, you know, it's your turn in the barrel. But uh, that didn't didn't come into it for a long time. And so I was a teacher, an instructor pilot, and, and I got to fly the world's greatest airplanes. However, uh, I was beginning to drink a little bit now. I say I was beginning to drink a little bit. Because I was half Russian and half Italian, the Russian part of me gave me a liver that was incredible. I could drink more than anybody else without feeling that, without having the same effect. You and I would be drinking, you'd be on the floor there throwing up, and, and, and I would be saying, you ought not to drink like that. You know, that's bad. It's bad for you. The fact that I drunk more than he did had not, never played any, anything on me. Because you see, as an officer and a gentleman, you would never see me drunk. When I started to slur a little bit, or I started to do this, or I'd leave. You didn't see me. I'd go upstairs, and I'd go to bed, and I'd lay down on the bed and watch, the, put my foot on the floor because the whole room was going around and around and around. All those kind of neat things that, uh, that we Elkies did. But you never saw me drunk. You don't see an officer drunk. And I was able to do that for years and years and years. And so, because I was flying airplanes, I had the control factor was there. I had to control my drinking. Now, to qualify as an alcoholic is talking about controlling and enjoying my drinking. When I was controlling it, I sure as shit wasn't enjoying it. And when I was not controlling it, I was out of it. That's the way I was. It was all or nothing. I didn't have anything. And this illness is progressive. It progressed in me slowly, but it began to move on and on faster and faster. And when I got to, I finished my combat tour in Vietnam, and I came back over here. How did Bud get to England? And that's where I came. I came from Vietnam, and I was stationed at Aria Bentwaters in Suffolk, and I had a command up there. And now, instead of flying those missions, I'm sitting on a nuclear bomb. Maybe people didn't realize that we had nuke bombs over here, but 
Bud is sitting on a 1.2 megaton bomb, and he's an alcoholic. He? <laughs> now, if I told you this 1.2 megaton bomb that I was sitting on could wipe out everything inside the M25, you get an idea of the kind of power that I might be sitting there with. However, because I was also in charge of writing the war plans for going to war, this was the Cold War. We were really concerned about this. I'd be laughing about it. I'd be I'd be sitting down there talking about, well, we're going to go here, and we got these submarines going to go over there, and then these B-52s are coming over here, and then these bombers are going to go to Dresden. And I got to thinking and talking to the other guy and said, hey, wait a minute, what the hell's going on here? We're not going to have any base to come back to. We take off, that's it, it's over. The whole thing is over. So we used to say things like, well, we're going to take a, a pod, we'll carry another pod on the airplane, and in that we'll keep our ski equipment, our skis and, and trousers and stuff. And then after we drop the bomb in Russia, or we'll turn right and go to Switzerland <laughs> and bail out. And that way we can ski. The fact that there would be a nuclear cloud over the whole of the bloody world didn't even enter <laughs> That's how funny it was. And and we began to think of this, that what are we doing here? This is just is insanity. Now, people would say, well, maybe that's why you drank like you did. No, no, no. Bud drank because Bud was an alcoholic. Bud was addicted to this chemical. Now, if I tell you, getting into the development of this addiction and how it progresses in us, that it gets to a point where that drinking... Yellow fit. Who's got a yellow fit? Okay. <laughs> We're going to move the yellow fit. Um, it gets to a point in this addictive stage of ours that we, if we look at the back of the brain in the, in the very, very deep part of our intellect, we have fight or flight mode that we learned. We got that when we first became human beings, chased by the big tigers and stuff like that. That never left us. So we know that if everything gets down to really desperation, we'll either run or we're going to fight. That's how we are. That's exactly how the brain functions. Now, the addictiveness of this chemical in our brains gets to the point where it overtakes that area to the point where I must drink to survive. I will not survive if I don't drink. So if you say to somebody, an alcoholic, and he's not, he hasn't got into this system of saying I've had enough, there is nothing we can do, nothing anybody could tell me or say to me that says, you don't have to drink. What the hell are you talking about? The further I got from that drink, the closer I was to the next one. And it was always going to be that way. I had to drink because that's what Bud was. Bud was an alcoholic. And I had this physical craving that once I started to drink, I had no mental defense against the next one. And I would drink till I had enough, or I passed out, or whatever. Run out of money. That was the only reason I was stopping. Now, what's the other side of this? Because it's twofold, it's a mental illness as well. And that mental illness is telling Bud that if he didn't have a drink, that life was going to get worse. It didn't get better. Most people, you say, Jesus, you're drinking too much. Stop drinking, you're going to get a lot. But you, you'll get better. And they do. You know, they're not dancing on the, on the bloody piano with their golf shoes on. But for me, it didn't get better. It got grayer and deeper. And then I had this little guy sitting on my shoulder and says, Bud, remember just a couple of gin and tonics. Now, that's all. That's all. We can just have a couple of gin and tonic. It would be all, it would make you feel a lot better. And it did. The problem was, once that first alcohol went down that pipe, there was no couple anymore. It was Bud would drink until he had enough, until it was over. That's how it was. So it goes from that mental obsession to that physical craving, just like that. Now, I say I've recovered from alcohol, from my, my illness there. What I haven't done is cured myself. 
I know that Bud is cannot drink. But that's what he learned in the first step, wasn't it? The first step, bang. Now let me go back just a little bit here and tell you, just before we get into my sobriety, how I got sober, I went to, uh, back to the States. Now, <laughs> this, this was really getting to be hilarious now. Um, I went back to the States to my, no, before I went back there, let me tell you about before I left the Air Force. I'm getting ready to retire now from the U.S. Air Force, and I am drinking quite a bit. Matter of fact, I'm drinking a hell of a lot. And I, my illness has progressed now because now I was promoted out of the cockpit. So I wasn't flying. I was on, I was on the ground. I was a commander there. And, um, and I was felt very proud. I would go into the bar, into our officers club every night. My wife would say, well, what do you, why don't you come home? No, no, I had to talk about flying in the bar, right? Bullshit. I was in there to drink. And I was so pleased when Jock knew what I was drinking. He'd always have gin on the rocks with a twist of lemon. That's what was, that's what I drank. And I thought, he remembers. Well, Jesus, this colonel comes in here every night. He's drinking the same bloody thing until he's pissed. And and you think <laughs> he can't remember that? <laughs> Anyhow, I get within about six months of coming out of the Air Force, and I'm going to live over here. I'm going to stay here. Uh, in this country, because um, I thought that possibly I had an ex-wife and uh, in the states, and I wouldn't have to once I retired. I wouldn't have to pay alimony if I uh, uh, if I stayed out of the country. Now that's what that's why I was staying over here, right? My wife thought I was staying over because I loved her. I was going to stay here for that, and I did. Anyway, I. Uh, Ah, what did I do? Yes. I said, I'm going to stay over here. Now, if I'm going to stay over here, and uh, we have what we call the Class 6 store, or the Naffy there, and a 40-ounce bottle of gin was a pound, because I didn't have to pay the tax on it, and uh, all the officers were allowed one bottle a week of spirits, However, because I was the commander, I was given a little card that said, you're going to probably be entertaining more than most of these officers will here. So this little card says that you can have as many, you know, more than that. So I get my sack truck, and I start going down to the Class 6 store, and instead of buying a bottle, I'm buying four cases at a time, right? Give me the four cases, Ed, yep. Put them in there, back into the car, back to home. And we lived in a place called Two Barns. It was in Ike, just two miles, three miles from the base. And we had a barn there. And inside that barn, Bud starts stacking his booze. And then the next day, I would go down. We'll have four more of those cases. I'd run him out of gin, and I'd take whiskey. If I'd run him out of whiskey, I'd, I'd take something else. to get some. I said, better get that stuff in, because I'm going to need some more. Well, I did this for months now. Now, can you imagine four four cases at a time. Well, it got after, I don't know, it was probably about three months of, of this, and that's, we're talking about a lot of booze now. Uh, I get a knock on my door. It's Her Majesty's Customs and Excise. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, Colonel, we have this list here. Um... And it appears that uh, that you are abusing this privilege of uh, alcohol. I says, well, I have this card that says I can get as much as I am. I'm about to retire, and uh, and they're thinking all this time that he's buying it cheap. He's selling it. That's what he's going to do, right? He's not going to he's not going to drink this. But alcoholics of my kind would realize that that's not you're, you're you're joking, right? I'm drinking that stuff. It may take me a couple of years to get through it, but I'm drinking it. So they said, uh, I said, no, 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 this is for my own consumption. He says, <laughs> come on, you could, I mean, you could be entertaining half a Ipswich for crying out loud. <laughs> no, no, it's for me. He says, okay, show us. If it's for your consumption, show us where it is. So I take them out, open up the 
barn doors, and there it is, stacked up like this. It looked like a bonded warehouse. And they thought, we got him. Just before the trucks come in, he's selling it, right? We got him here. So I have to go back. They, they tell my boss now. And he calls me in. And he said, Bud, what the hell are you doing? Thank God he was an alcoholic as well. <laughs> because um, he said, take that stuff back and get your money back. He said, I don't want to hear about it anymore. But what he didn't do was take my card. And it just so happens that Woodbridge, I, I'm taking it all back. Stack truck after stack truck. The, the Bentwaters, just over the Tunstall Forest there, that's where we hid the nuke bombs, by the way. Um, there was Woodbridge. And Woodbridge had a, a, a classic store, too. So I took it back over here, and I go over to Woodbridge, get the sack truck. It's going out of there, out of Woodbridge. Never thinking, you know, never thinking that, well, they might just understand that there are two places, and they might just be able to find the stuff. And I did that until I had about 40 cases or something like that. Back on the door again, right? <laughs> this time the old man calls me in and he says, Give me that damn card. Tore up my card. And I was really angry because I hadn't done anything wrong. I had a card that says I could have as much as that as I wanted and I'm getting out of the Air Force and I'm going to you know, use it for my own consumption. The fact that my wife said, We're going to need two more moving lorries because we we're coming down to Suff Sussex just to carry the booze. <laughs> These guys thought I was opening a pub. They were going to start a pub. Anyhow, I had to take it all back. Now, here's what this guy could have done. He said, Bud, as your commander, you, you violate a, a direct order, number one. I could, have, I could have you arrested. I could have your pension taken from you and have you put in jail. And if I told you I was, I've been retired now for 38 years. Now, that's how much money they would have taken. They, for what? For a few bottles of booze. Now, that's insanity. That's how crazy it was. Now, if I told you it took me 10 years after that before I finally got this program. I got sober when I was 50. You don't have to add up the rest of the days. <laughs> so, at that, how did Bud get sober? Hmm, that was interesting. I went back to my niece's wedding in 83. Uh, I didn't even go back to my daughter's wedding. And now I had changed my drinking habits to a point where uh, I was drinking, I was drinking a lot. I had a watch that only had fives on it. And I never drank before five. And so no matter what it said, it was a five. Uh, it's five o'clock. Must be five o'clock. So I'm going to have. A, I better have a, a little bit to drink. Um, and I made all the stuff. You know, made all the wines. Nobody would touch it because it, I never let it. I, I could never let it ferment out. For Christ's sake, it was always dark. It was always hazy. Uh, I could never let it get clear. And then I had to fortify it. I had to put a little vodka in there because it didn't taste quite as good. You know, it took longer. And I drank for the effect that it produced, not for the taste. So anyway, um, and after four years of being uh, of being retired, living in a lovely place in in in, in England, I um, I was going to go back to the states because I wasn't very happy. I had a lovely home, a lovely wife, a five year old uh, son, and I wasn't happy. I wanted to live over the Playboy Club in Portsmouth. That's where I thought I'd be happy. That was my idea. Of happy, and also I got a job working for a brewery. What better job for a practicing alky than working for a brewery? I was firing guys in this area for drinking like I was drinking. Managers of these pubs, and that's where I would go. I'd go find these pubs. Well, anyway, that's I did that for about four years as a drunk. I was more interested in having a wine cupboard in my room in my office than I was at desk. I wanted the booze in there so I could have people come in and I could get them drink. And I did that. So anyhow, I go back to my niece's wedding because my brother's rich. And I knew it was going to be a big party and I knew it was going to be a lot of, a lot of booze. And I took, I was going to stay with my sister 
and her and her husband and uh, and so I took a, a lovely bottle of uh, I never will forget this I took a bottle of of uh, Glen I think it was in a lovely box super bottle of whiskey and I took that back and I was going to give it to my brother in law and I'm staying because it was going to be a surprise I'm staying in a hotel just down the road from there so the night before I I go over to their house. I go down to the bar and it was two dollars or something like that for a you know a small gin or gin and tonic or whatever it was or a whiskey. I said, no, no, wait a minute, I'm not going to pay that kind of money. So I went back up to the room and I said, well, I'm going to drink half of this bottle of whiskey anyway. I might as well have mine now. <laughs> and so I drank a half a bottle of whiskey. My brother-in-law, and every time I go back now, I take him a bottle of whiskey with me and give it to him. But I gave him this half a bottle. And he opened, you know, he, can you imagine opening the box up and it's half empty. And I said, I said, Bob, I said, I understand what you're saying. I said, but uh, uh, I was going to drink half of it anyway, so this is for you. And I don't have to have that part. Of it. Now, this is... Uh, can you see where we're going with this? We got a little insanity working in here, huh? The elevator is not going all the way up, and we know that. Anyway, I see my brother over there, and he is six years sober. And he was my biggest drinking buddy. And he saw what a wreck I was in. I was really red, bald, sick, justified throwing up, that sort of thing. Must have had a good time. Can you tell me what I did? Uh, and we'd gone to this, this wedding and came back from that wedding and, uh, he said, I asked him, I said, why are you not drinking? He said, no, no, no. And he says, I, you know, I, I, I got sober. Sober? Yeah. Oh, I, said, I, I go to AA. Oh, is that right? I didn't know anything about AA. I thought that's where a bunch of drunks went to figure out how they could drink normally, you know, with the old coats on. And, um, and he said, uh, no, and he told me a story. And I said, gee, the things he was telling me were things I was doing. I would drive to work to the, into the brewery uh, with the bottle. I was drinking sherry then because it was too expensive for the other stuff. And, and I'd have it in a paper bag, you know, in between my legs. And I'd be sipping on that going to work. And, uh, and he said, uh, what the hell do you have in the paper bag for? I said, People looking at this, me drinking out of the bottle. He says, "Why didn't you put it in a coke can?" I never thought of that. I never thought of that. That's how. Cra- but that stuck with me. That was it. That was because that's what he did. And so that started the little thing. And he says, "Well, you want to come to one of these these meetings? I'm going to this meeting, and it was in Anaheim, California, and I did it. And I heard, and I saw you people in there." And I said, my God, these people are laughing and they're telling terrible, terrible stories about the things that they did. And especially the women. My God, the things that they driving their kids to school pissed out of their minds. And uh, and the affairs that they used to have and falling asleep, you know, fixing dinner with a bottle of wine and then falling asleep and the kids had to put them to bed. And all oh, it's awful stuff. And they're laughing about it. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is me. I can understand this. So my brother gave me the big book. He says, it's in there. He says, everything is in there that you need to know about getting sober and staying sober. He says, but you need to get a sponsor because uh, you're not smart enough to do it on your own. And I said to him, Ray, do you realize how many degrees I have? And he said, uh, and so does the thermometer, and you know where they stick some of those. <laughs> so I suggest that you get a sponsor and you work through these steps and then you start to work on this program of recovery and a day at a time I have been doing that and it was amazing just the other day I was thinking that do you know I helped there were three of us started a meeting in Midhurst 27 years ago and it's still going and I think to myself do you know one of these days I'm going to qualify for being an old-timer. I'm not there yet. <laughs> now, how is it that I, that I do this? What you were saying is very, very apropos. Yes, 
it's difficult. It's a daily program. I'm not cured because I know all I have to do is let my head get screwy by being hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. Those are the four perception changes. They change how I think. And if I think for one second, and Bud doesn't think about drinking anymore, but if I just think maybe it could be better with just that one drink, I'm off and running. Now, by going to my meetings and working these program, this, this program as best I can each day, I find that I don't have those thoughts. For the first five years, I used to get up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, I've been drinking. Terrible dreams about that kind of stuff. And then, quietly, it goes away. It just gets less. It's not as intense. But I still get, I still have problems. Now, I've been married 41 years. And when I was drinking, my wife, I, it was great for her because I didn't care. As long as I had my bottle and it's quiet and I can get off someplace and drink. And she didn't make any, any, she could do everything. She got us the house. She did the, so I gave her the money. I didn't want to even know about how much it was. Uh, you take care of all of that sort of stuff. When Bud got sober, that changed everything. When I came back and got sober, now Bud wants to take control. And that, it was all right when you had a chief in an India, and now you put two chiefs in that house, and you've got some problems. And that's taken a long time. It's a long time to be able to understand and say, Bud, you don't have the power over people, places, and things. You've got to accept that, that they are different. I discovered that women are different. Big time. Big time. I knew all about lust. I knew nothing about love. It's getting better. It's getting better. But what's fun about this, if you're not enjoying, and that's, I say this all the time to my other Alfie friends, if you're not enjoying your recovery, you're doing something wrong. Because this is not the business to get into to feel miserable. If I wanted to be miserable, I could get back into the booze. That made me feel very, very miserable. This is fun. This is a whole different life. And what's beautiful to see today is these young people that come in to this program, young people, the 20s and even in their teens, and they don't have to go through what I had to go through. They don't have to do that. They can start growing up emotionally. They got off that track going this way, way up here. And so they become really whole lives in front of them. So it's a marvelous, marvelous program. It's the only one I know that works long term. As long as you stay close to this fellowship, you stay close to the people that are in there, um, and you do the best you can at, at working these steps. And and for that, I am eternally grateful. And thank you all for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.